Psalm 112, Psalm 112. You're saying, Randy, what verses are we going to read? We're going to read them all. So be prepared. Buckle up. But before we do, can I just ask you a simple question? We need to start. Before we can go any further, we need to start today's message with a simple question. I believe it's a question that you should be asking yourself every time you walk into these church doors. Every time you come to study hall, every time you come to church, I think you need to be asking this question. And the question is this. Do you believe the Bible or not? Do you believe the Bible or not? Do you believe Psalm 1830? It says, all the Lord's promises prove true. Do you believe, do you trust Psalm 197? It says, the law of the Lord is perfect. It gives new strength. The commands of the Lord are trustworthy, giving wisdom to those who lack it. So what are we hearing there? What's the Bible saying about itself? The Bible is saying about itself that it is true, that it is perfect, And that it is trustworthy. Now, let me ask you something. What else in your life makes that claim? What else in your life makes that declaration? By the way, have you ever asked yourself why men don't follow instructions? Why we don't read instructions? I don't know about the rest of the men in this room. I'll go ahead and tell you why I don't read the instructions very often, if I can figure it out. We've gotten some stuff into the house this week to help us do better with our life groups. And and one of the reasons why I don't read instructions because I'm 51 years old and, and I've had instructions that just completely get things wrong. I have had instructions that leave things out. I have, le- I have found instructions uh, oftentimes leave me worse off than I was before. And so that's why this 51-year-old semi-intelligent man does not read instructions. Why? Because far too often they make things worse. Well, not so the Bible. What does the Bible say? The Bible says it is true, that it is perfect, that it is trustworthy. In fact, 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All, all, all Scripture, even the ones you don't like, all Scriptures, even the ones that says wives submit to your husbands, all Scriptures, even the ones that say give 10 plus percent to the church, all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong with our lives. Do you see what he's saying there? Please don't miss this. He's saying there's two purposes for you to read the Bible. Some of you, I got two texts this week. I'm so proud of you. So your te- you text me. You love to text me when you've completed the Bible from Genesis to, to the maps. But the whole purpose of reading the Bible is found in that verse. There's two points. One of one is to reveal truth to you. But also, the second purpose of reading the Bible is so that that truth can change you. And so if you're reading the Bible, here, here's what breaks my heart. This is what concerns me. You do realize my wife read the Bible from Genesis to the maps five times before she even got saved. What did she do? She wasted her time. Why? Because she wasn't accepting the truth about herself, and she wasn't allowed that truth to change you. In fact, I was so thankful that Jason reminded us today in study hall. If you don't get a chance to come to study hall, I'm telling you, you're missing. It's great. I know it's early. It's dark 30. But if you can make it, I promise you, I have never been disappointed. Because you do realize, I don't even have to come. I mean, it's his baby. I don't even have to show up. But it has always been a blessing to me. And I'm so thankful that he reminded us today that there's three responses to truth. When John Gates is confronted about the truth when it comes to money. When John Gates is confronted about the truth when it comes to his job. When John Gates is confronted with the truth, there's three responses. There's what? Hey, change. Repent. Oh, God, fix me. I'm broken. Second response is what? Get mad and leave. All right? To get upset, say, you know what? I'm never going back to that church. But there is a third response that in, for, in, in, here that we believe is even worse, and that is you're confronted with the truth, and you act like everything's okay. You do realize in the recent months, Some of you have been confronted about the fact that you're having sex outside of marriage. And your response to that truth is what? Eh, I'm still going to do it. We've been confronted late recently about what God's word says about money. And you're just like Judas in the fact that you're just like, eh, no big deal. I'm going to continue to go on and do what I do. I'm going to follow the Lord in the limited areas that I follow the Lord. Well, guess what? You're wasting your time. Why? The whole point of Scripture is to reveal truth to Alicia, and then that truth change her from the inside out. And so again, do you believe the Bible or not? Because probably the reason why you have not allowed the Bible to change you from the inside out 
is the fact that you don't believe what it says. You're saying, Randy, why are you asking me this? You're just being mean. You're always so mean to me. Why are you being so mean to me? Why are you asking me that? Well, here's why. We're getting ready to read Psalm 112. And this chapter is crazy. This chapter is outlandish. This chapter is amazing. This chapter has so many promises in it that will bless your life. I mean, it literally, you can walk out of here today if you believe Psalm 112. I mean, believe it, believe into it. If you believe it, guess what? Your life will never be the change. You will enter into a season of blessing like you've never experienced in your life. But here's the thing. If you don't believe the Bible, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss out on the wonderful, abundant life that God promises us in the chapter that we're getting ready to read. And so I'm going to ask you one more time. Do you believe the Bible or not? It's a simple choice. I choose to believe what God's Word says, and because I choose to believe that, it's going to change me. That truth is going to transform me. That truth is not going to confirm my bias. It's going to make me different. So if today you choose to believe God's Word, read with me if you would. Psalm 112, one of the more amazing chapters in all the Bible. Verse 1 says this, Praise the Lord! How joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying His commands. Their children will be successful everywhere. An entire generation of godly people will be blessed. They themselves will be wealthy, and their good deeds will last forever. Light shines in the darkness for the godly. They are generous, compassionate, and righteous. Good comes to those who lend money generously and conduct their business Fairly, such people will not be overcome by evil. Those who are righteous will be long remembered. They do not fear bad news. They confidently trust the Lord to care for them. They are confident and fearless and can face their foes triumphantly. They share freely and give generously to those in need. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. They will have influence and honor. And verse 10 is one of my favorite verses. The wicked will see this, what? The wicked will see the godly. The wicked will see God's work in their heart and life and be infuriated. They will grind their teeth in anger. They will slink away their hopes thwarted. Hmm. What do you see there? Well, the first thing, before we can go any further, because there's so much there, I I want you to get it all. But before we go any further, we got to understand and acknowledge and believe this fact. And the fact is this. Godly people are generous compassionate and righteous some of you like to go around telling everybody oh i'm godly i I try to lead i try to be a good person i try to be a godly person well godly people according to scripture are generous compassionate and righteous go back to psalm 112 4 it says the godly are generous compassionate and righteous what does it mean to be generous the definition of generous is this to be gracious to bend down in kindness to one in need to show favor we first see it in Genesis 33, 5. It says, these are the children God has generously given to me. What's Jacob saying there? He's saying that God graciously bent down in kindness and showed favor to him through his children. What was God doing? God was being generous. What's the definition of compassionate? Compassionate is to act in, express, and show love. If you want to write this down, compassion is love in action. Compassion is not some feeling that just sits in your gut. No, compassion is when that love inside of you gets you off your blessed assurance and you get up and you do something and you show something. You show love for those in your life. What does it mean to be righteous? What's the definition of righteous? He says uh, it, it is to be fair, to be obedient to God's word and to do what's right. We see it in Genesis 6, 9. It says Noah was a righteous man. And so if, you would, if you're asking yourself, am I a godly person, then are you generous? Are you compassionate? Are you righteous? By the way, it makes sense. To be godly means to be like God, and so therefore God is compassionate, God is generous, God is righteous. So therefore we must, if we want to be godly, we must be that way too. It's the same principle as Christian. You do realize if you go around calling yourself Christian, what you are saying is, I'm like Jesus. It means to be like Christ. And so to be godly means to be like Father God. To be Christian means to be like Jesus. And what what is Jesus and God like? They are generous, compassionate, and righteous. Now, don't miss this, though. Because some of you get caught up, and you're going to miss this point. 
don't miss this. You can't be godly without being generous. You can't be godly. You cannot be like God without being a generous person. But here's the thing. Right now, I bet you right now you're sitting here saying, you're saying oh, I'm a generous person. I'm very giving. I give all the time. Give, 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 give. That's me. Here's the problem, though. As with every other word in the Bible, you don't get to decide what that word means. God decides what it means to be generous. And so what does God say? Who does God say is generous? And that's found in this truth. And the truth is this. Generous people are, first of all, full of fear and delight. Generous people are full of fear and and delight. Go back to Psalm 112.1. It says, generous people are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying his commands. Now here's what, what does it mean to fear? Because you know what? I have been amazed all my life at how people try to do what the, what, what I call hermeneutical gymnastics, which is when you interpret the Bible. And I love the way we twist the word fear. We twist this thing called fear and we try to mean it something that it doesn't mean. It says, oh, I just respect God. I just respect. No. What does the Hebrew word for fear mean? What is the definition of fear? It means terror. It means dread. It means deep fright of terrible power. Go stand in front of the ocean. How about this? Go 50 yards out in the ocean, and you will understand what terrible might is. That ocean will pick you up, throw you around, and head plant you into the sand. And fear, fear is terror, dread, and deep fright of terrible power. And we see it, we see it in the oldest book in the Bible. Job 28, 28 says this. The fear, the terror, the dread, the deep fright of terrible power. The fear of the Lord is wisdom. To stay away from evil is understanding. So what is he saying there? He's saying generous people are full of dread of what God's going to do to them if they sin. And that, that, that dread, that fear, leads him to avoid evil by obeying God's command. So don't tell me you're generous if you are not scared to death of God. But not only are they fearful people of God, they, not only do they fear God, but they, the verse also says that generous people are full of fear and delight. What does it mean to delight? It means to be pleased with. It means to desire. It means to take pleasure in. We see it in Psalm 119.35. It says, God, make me walk along the path of your commands, for that is where my delight is found. We see it also expressed in, in the Greek, in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, it says, you must decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pleasure, uh, pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully, who delights in giving. So guess what? Generous people don't just obey the Bible. They don't just don't obey the Bible reluctantly and hesitantly. Generous people delight, they're pleased with, they desire, they take pleasure in obeying God's commands. Now, what commands are we talking about? What commands should Carolina, if she wants to be a generous person, what commands should we delight in, should we be pleased in, desire, take pleasure in, obeying? What commands are we talking about? Well, we see the first one in Deuteronomy 15, 7 through 10. Read it with me. It says, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward those in need. Instead, be generous and lend them whatever they need. Do not be mean-spirited. If you do, you will be considered guilty of sin. Give generously to those in, to the needy, not grudgingly, for the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. We see it also, Jesus says in Matthew 10, 8, it says, give as freely as you have received. Proverbs 11, 24 and 25 says, Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. By the way, God had the richest man of all time write that for us. And Jesus ends it by saying this, Luke 12, 33, Sell your possession and give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. Now hear me. Because again, we've got to make sure you understand what's going on here. These are not helpful hints. This is not positive, encouraging Caleb. This is a holy God staring at his children and saying, Thou shalt do this. And that children, if they're true children, should be afraid because they have that foundational fear, that terror, that dread of terrible power, that children should be afraid not to, to, to even think about not being generous. 
You see, this is not you saying, oh, maybe this is a good idea. This is not an investment strategy. This is not me telling you to get a budget. These are direct commands from God saying, hey, if you're my kid, you're either going to be generous or I'm going to discipline you. And so what does it mean to be generous? What is biblical generosity? we got to get this right, guys. We have got to get this right if we don't get anything else. What is biblical generosity? We see, number one, that generosity comes from a changed heart. Generosity comes from a changed heart. How do I know that? Well, when dealing with generosity, God goes straight to the heart. In Deuteronomy 15, 7 through 10, it says, Do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted. Do not be mean-spirited, not grudgingly. You see, generosity only comes. It only occurs when we allow God to kill our natural, stingy, manipulative, and hateful heart and replace it with a generous heart that is gracious, kind, and merciful. You do understand this, right? That you were born with a stingy heart. I had a grandfather tell me the other day, he had, he had his two, son, two grandsons over at his house. And one grandson had 72 toys around him. And there was one toy over here that he had not played with in 30 minutes. Well, then his little brother comes over and dare touches his little toy over here that he hasn't played with in 30 minutes. And what did the big brother do? He got up, knocked him over the head and said, mine. By the way, have you ever had to teach your kids to do that or do they do that naturally? By the way, you were born with a manipulative heart. One of the things I love about being a godfather, not in the mafia type way, I, which would be cool. I'm just going to put that out there. But I'm not. Justin, I'm not. I promise. But being a godfather is I get to not only, you know, as a father, I get to see my kids, but then I get to see other kids. Well, this is what I've noticed from the Bruchon kids. They are amazing. When Jacob or Elizabeth see Abigail with a toy that they want, this is what they'll do. They'll go over and they'll get the shiniest, newest toy they can find that they don't want. right? And they'll get that girl and they'll go, hey, Abigail, you want this toy? And Abigail will go, go, sure. So she drops the toy that they want, grabs their toy, and they're like, <laughs> Now, if you're Teresa, the grandma, you're going to go, oh, aren't they generous? No, they're not generous. They're manipulative they just manipulated that poor child right so that that's by the way that's normal in us that's what we were born with that's who we are and so true generosity only comes when we get that heart transplant that we talk about around here all the time and not only after you become a true believer not only after you become a saved, then you not only have, then you have to wake up every morning and say oh god please kill my stingy flesh my manipulative flesh, my hateful flesh, and fill me with a generous spirit. By the way, can I please write this down? Because I know what some of you are arguing. Because anytime I talk about generosity, you start this, making this argument. True generosity is a mark of a large heart, not a large bank account. Generosity, because see, I got 15 year olds old in here and just brag to me, I ain't, I ain't never even had a bank account. So he's sitting there going, well, you know, I guess I, I, don't, I, you know, I don't have to be generous because I ain't got no money. No. Generosity is not the mark of a large bank account. It is a mark of a large heart. In fact, one of the most stupid, generous men I've ever met in my life, he did thousands of dollars worth of work for free for me, and he did tens of thousands of dollars of work for people in the church for free every year and this stupid generous man had four kids and a wife and he lived in 1300 square foot house and he drove two 15 year old cars but he was stupid generous why because god changed him from the inside out and he realized that generosity has got nothing to do with how much you got in the bank it has everything to do with your heart and so we see that generosity comes from a changed heart. But notice, secondly, generosity is given to those in need. Generosity is given to those in need. I can't find a verse that talks about generosity that doesn't include the needy. And Deuteronomy 15.10 continues. It says, give generously to who? The needy. What's the definition of needy? Someone lacking. Someone poor. Someone destitute. 
We see the same word in 1 Samuel 2, 8 when Hannah declares that the Lord lifts the poor from the dust and needy from the garbage dump. You see, needy people are people who lack something and can't get it. Pe- needy people are someone who are without and don't know how to get what they need. That's what it means to be needy, right? And so our job as generous people is to identify those in tr- true need, genuine need, and to be generous in providing for them that which they cannot provide for themselves. By the way, this is the opposite of most of our generosity. Most of you, when you go around telling everybody how generous you are, you know what you do? You give to those who give back to you. Oh, you invite, them over to you, you invite people over to your house to eat, that you're pretty confident that they're going to invite you back one day. You buy lunch for somebody at the restaurant. Why? Because you're pretty confident that they're going to buy you lunch one day. You see, what we call generosity is not true generosity. It's the opposite of what the Bible says generosity. When we give to those who give to us, when we give to those who already have, we're not being generous. In fact, I think that's what we do. Most of us think we're generous based upon how we treat our family. Well, by the way, when you give generously to your grandkids that already have 72 toys, are you really being generous? When you give to your family member and you invite them over and you have those Sunday afternoon dinners and you're generous with your food there, are you really giving to them? Don't they already have it? Can't they get food on their own? By the way, what does Jesus think about this? You think Jesus is going to praise you? For being generous to your family who already have what they need? You think Jesus is going to praise you for being generous to those who give back to you? No, look, notice, notice what he says in Luke 6, 32. He says, if you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. Are you beginning to have a hole poked in what you call Generosity. Because what I have found is most of what we call generosity is manipulative. We'll buy flowers for our wife because we want something in return. We give to the church because we want something in return. True generosity is finally financially blessing those who are lacking, poor, and destitute. Those who can't give back. In fact, can I share something with you? Often the needy, their need is not limited to money. Hear me for a second. I am very generous to waitresses everywhere I go. You want to know why? Because these waitresses, even though I, I, they're not lacking money, I don't know if, you, if you've ever really talked to a waitress or a waiter, you can make bank being a waitress or a waiter why am i generous to those that i know in fact one one of the ones i'm generous to on a consistent basis just bought a house probably nicer than most of y'all you want to know why i'm generous to her even though she's got money because she does she needs to know that there are christians out there who are not stingy have you ever talked to waiters and waitresses they hate working the sunday shift why people leave church and they go get something to eat, and they're ugly, and they're stingy. One of my grandfather, who, who was a church man all of his life, chairman of the deacons, chairman of the trustee, chairman of the board, would go to the local fish house, have 10 people, have 10, people, 10 of his family there, run up a $70 bill on a Sunday after church, and would leave $1. And said, she should be thankful. You know what I would do? I would always leave my coat. And then after he walked out, because I was trying to respect my elder, because he, he'd cuss you, church guy, he'd cuss you if he found out you did this. I would always leave my coat, and then I'd go, oh, man, I forgot my coat. And I would walk back to get my coat, and I'd put a $10 bill, even though I didn't have it. Why? Because God changed my heart. Can I make another case? Let me give you another example. Why do we give Bibles out to people? Most of y'all have money. Most of y'all have... These Bibles cost 15 to $20. Most of y'all could do that, but here's what you lack. You lack the ability to know where you can find a Bible in a language that you understand, that makes sense to you. 
And so we're generous to you by giving you Bibles because of your need, because of your lack, because you are destitute, because the only Bible you ever grew up with had these and thousand verilies and was written in 1611. How about your neighbor? Why would we be generous to our neighbors? They're living in the same neighborhood we're living in. Obviously, they make about the same kind of money that we make. Why? You know we just built that house in Forest Oaks. We're living in a neighborhood that there are some houses that are four, five, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000. Why would Jennifer, Jennifer and I go around to our neighbors and be generous to them? Why? Because have you ever noticed that you can live in a neighborhood and still feel all alone? We're generous to them because they lack their destitute knowing that somebody cares. One last thing, then I'll stop. I'll give you another example. Your coworkers. Why be generous to your coworkers? We know they get a paycheck because they get paid like you. Your coworkers are probably destitute of love and action. Have you noticed that love has become that word that everybody uses and nobody does? So why take your coworker out to eat? Why bless your coworker as the Spirit leads at Christmas? Why? Because we want them to know that real love, true love, works. Real love, true love, does. And so we see what? We see that generosity comes from a changed heart. We see that generosity is given to those who are in need. But there's a third thing, and here's the thing. Here's, here's going to be where we decide whether you truly believe the Bible or not. We see number three, that generosity results in supernatural blessings. Generosity results in supernatural blessings. I don't know if you paid attention, but let me read them to you. So some of the verses that I've read to you again this week, today. And then go back to Deuteronomy 15.10. It says, the Lord will bless generous people in everything you do. Proverbs 11, 24 and 25. Again, richest man of all history says, give freely and become more wealthy. The generous will prosper notice what jesus says give and store up treasure for you in heaven again none of that sounds normal to me none of that sounds natural you're not going to find that in some economic textbook it makes no sense to be generous especially in this economy and yet god says hey if you choose to be a, a generous if as a christian you choose to act on that heart that he's placed within you then he will it will result in supernatural blessings you're saying i don't know if i believe you again did you read psalm 112 with me did you even listen to it because here are the blessings that are promised to those who are generous ready just this is just psalm 112 in Psalm 112, we see what blessings are promised. We see that deep joy is given to those who are generous. Verse 1 says, how joyful are those who are generous. Now, again, we have this problem around here where we like to worship our children. We like to make our children more important than they are. Well, if you truly love your children, then you need to stop giving to them and start giving to others. Why? Because generous people have prosperous children. Notice verse 2. It says their children will be successful everywhere. Don't you want that for your kids? then be generous. Not only that, if we're generous, we will have a huge impact on a generation. Verse 2 says this, an entire generation of godly people will be blessed. Think about that. Generous people aren't just blessing those that they're blessing. They're blessing a whole generation. Not only that, if you're generous, you will have earthly wealth. Notice what verse 3 says, they themselves will be wealthy. But not just here on earth. Notice next that we'll get eternal rewards. Psalm 112, 3 says, their good deeds will last forever. But here's the thing. That's not all. Did you read with me? I, I can't get into it all of it because I'll be here all day. But plus, not only will we receive those five things, we'll also receive God's guidance. That's what it means light shines into their light. That get, when you need an answer, if you're generous, that God will provide you guidance. Well, his goodness, his security, his courage, his confidence, his influence and honor. Did you count them? There's 12 blessings, 12 supernatural blessings that comes if you choose to walk out of here today and be generous. If you choose today to quit blessing those who bless you, but bless those who can't bless you, 12 supernatural blessings are promised to those who are generous. Some of you are thinking, Randy, I don't have those things. I've been coming to church here for years. I don't have these things. I don't have those 12 blessings. I don't even have one. Have you ever asked yourself why not? 
Have you ever asked yourself why you can't have a, a savings account? Have you ever asked yourself why you can't delete debt? Have you ever asked yourself why? Why do you not have the blessings, the abundant life that God has promised you? Well, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 tells us. It says, remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. It's real clear, guys. The reason why, you, by the way, I, you're all blessed. You walked in here with clothes. Not all of you took a shower, but that's okay. You're all blessed. You had the ability to take a shower. You just chose not to do it. We're all blessed, but the reason why we're not supernaturally blessed is because we're not supernaturally generous. The reason why you haven't been abundantly blessed is because you haven't been abundantly generous. You think for some reason that your money is your money. I want better for you. I want the best for you. I want all 12 of these blessings to mark your life. Why? Because I love you. But also, let me ask you something. Say you listen to what we've talked about over the last month. And you put into practice and you surrender, like Zacchaeus, all of your money. Do you think if these 12 blessings were true of you, that people would start asking questions of you? If you started being crazy generous, showing love through your financial generosity, don't you think that would make God look good? Don't you think people would want to know what you got? Let's pray. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Every head bow. Every eye closed. Some of you are wondering, Randy, why, why, why are you being so hard on this? Why are, you, why are you coming at me so strong? Well, I knew this was important based upon those four commands that we read. I knew this was important based upon you receiving the abundant life that God has for you. But then I read a verse that told me, that revealed that our generosity is a test of our salvation. You want to know why you're constantly wondering if you're saved or not? You want to know why I'm constantly wondering if you're saved or not? 1 John 3.17 says this, If someone has enough money to live well and see a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? If you, your generosity confirms or denies your salvation, some of you, you've been coming to this church seven, eight, five, ten years, and you're still given the same thing that you gave seven, eight, nine, ten years ago? Okay, thank you. You've told me that you're a really good rule follower. You are... You're a, you're a good Pharisee. You're a good Sadducee. But you lack generosity. And that's concerning to me. These teenagers should be looking at their relationships around them and say, you know, I might not have money, but am I generous to my sister? When she asks for something that I have, that I want, do I share freely? How do I treat the, 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 the relationships in my life? Would my brother, would my sister, would my father, would my mother, would they say that I'm generous? Because, again, if you're failing this test, are you saved? There either needs to be generosity flowing from you, or there needs to be discipline hitting you. And if there's not, Houston, we got a problem. And so, again, I'm just going to ask. I can't make you. I, I'm not going to guilt you. I'm not going to push you. But I do want to encourage you. Please ask, oh God, am I saved? Am I truly saved? Do I have a new heart 
And if so, Lord, when did it happen? When? When did you do that heart transplant? When did you cut out that stingy, manipulative heart? When did you cut out that hateful, mean-spirited heart? And when did you give me a new heart? Lord, I need to know. I'm basing all of eternity on this. Lord, I'm facing hell if I get this wrong. And so, Lord, show me. Reveal to me. And if I'm not, today's the day. If you're not, now's the time. You can cry out. It doesn't take special robes or special clothes or special place. Cry out to a holy God and say, Oh God, I'm scared of you. I know you're going to send me to hell if I don't get this right. And oh God, I'm asking for you to change me. Cut out my old heart. Give me a new heart. Make me a new person. A generous person. Oh, let me pray for you. Dear God, I, I, I'm scared. I'm scared that we got a lot of people walking around here like Judas. and they're, they're, they're going to your church services. They're hearing your word. They're eating your food. But Lord, they're not yours. They're stingy. They're hard-hearted. They're hateful. And so God, I'm praying, I'm asking in Jesus' name that you will just break any lie that they're believing. Break their pride break whatever you need to break for them to cry out to you and be saved lord make it clear make it known if they can't remember a time that they got a heart transplant lord lord open their eyes good grief then it hadn't happened you can't get me the heart of jesus and i not remember the moment the, the place so lord i pray i pray for those of them are trying to be generous and they, they're not and they can't be and they're faking it Lord I pray for the salvation of everyone here and Lord for those of us who are saved be with us now as we deal with whether we truly believe the Bible or not in the next few moments in Jesus name I pray